Hello, everyone, and welcome to the South Orange Library Lecture Series Special Conversations. I'm Laura Sims, and I'm the moderator for the series. And I'm so excited to have Lynn Melnick with me this evening. Um, hi, Lynn. Hey. So Lynn and I met years ago in this Poet Moms Workshop group in Brooklyn. And we would get together once a month. Is that right? Yes, we month try. Month? Once a month. <laughs> we try. We try. Once a month. This is when kids were very little. And we would have the kids running around. And in the middle of that, we would be eating and talking and workshopping poems. I'm so impressed that we actually did that. In hindsight, it seems <laughs> poems. So that was super impressive. Um, but that's how I got to know and love Lynn and her poems. And so I'm so excited to have her here to talk about this wonderful new book, Refuse Nick. And we have a link in the chat, by the way, to the Yes, Yes Books page where you can order this fantastic book. And we will also have it in the library. Um, so Lynn's going to um, read from this new book and then answer questions from me and from the audience. But um, before that, I will tell you a little bit more about Lynn. She's the author of Refusenik from this year, Landscape with Sex and Violence from 2017, and If I Should Say I Have Hope, 2012, all with Yes, Yes books. She's also the co-editor of Please Excuse This Poem, 100 Poets for the Next Generation from Viking, and her memoir, which is coming out this year also, so two books in one year is, <laughs> wow, that's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it's, a lot. it's good. It's great. Yes, it's a but good it's problem to have, but it's a lot. Yeah. So her memoir is called, I've Had to Think Up a Way to Survive on Trauma, Persistence, and Dolly Parton. Um, and that's forthcoming from University of Texas Press's American Music Series. Late, when, when is it coming out this October year? October 4th, barring any you know, supply chain issues. Oh, right, okay, okay, that's exciting. You'll have a little breather, I guess. Yes. Between, yeah. So her poetry and essays have appeared in numerous places, including The New Yorker, The New Republic, LA Review of Books, and The Paris Review. And she has received grants from the Cafe Royal Cultural Society, the Hadassah Brandeis Institute, and the Hadassah Brandeis Institute. A former fellow at the New York Public Library's Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers, where she worked on Refusenik, yes. right? That was her project. Yeah. Um, and previously on the executive board of VITA, Women in Literary Arts, she currently teaches poetry at Columbia University and the 92nd Street Y. So please welcome Lynn Melnick, and she's going to read for a little bit. Yeah, I'm just going to read because the sort of evening was billed as uh, speaking about um, uh, intergenerational and personal trauma. And so, and that's a lot of what Refusenik is about. Um, so I'm going to read poems that speak to those things. There, there's a lot of stuff in the book, but um, uh, it really, at its core, it's about generational personal trauma. So um, um, let me see. I'm going to start with the first poem in the book, which um, is called The Night of the Murdered Poets. And The Night of the Murdered Poets I want to get the date right, so I'm looking it up. It refers to uh, the night of August 12th, 1952, during which 13 Soviet Jewish intellectuals were executed in a prison basement in Moscow on charges of treason and espionage. Um, and uh, let's see, is there anything else you need to know? The, the term Shema, it's a prayer. It's, um, it's one of the most important in the Jewish tradition. And it sort of, it's, it states that there is only, the, the Jewish belief that there is only one God. The Night of the Murdered Poets. I am writing this on a plane to California with several pens in my bag and all the water I want. It was evening when I left and will be evening when I get there. Sometimes I look at photos of myself and wonder why I was not smiling. It's hard to imagine we once mattered so much that they'd round us up. I mean, poets. I know Jews have often been rounded up. I am contemplating a vermin metaphor here just because of how hard it is to get us, but I know better. I had to look up cosmopolitanism in my dictionary. Forgive me, I did have a school, but I didn't show up much. I was too busy trying to murder myself. 
Stalin thought cosmopolitanism contemptible and Jewish. Want to demolish the core of a community? Once upon a time, you could simply kill the poets. But more poets arose in their place. Well, more poets arose in this place, I should say. I was growing. What is the word for something that grows peculiar and withstanding in California like the orange tree, not native to the soil? The first poem I wrote was about bleeding from my uterus onto glare-drenched stairs. After the poets died in a prison basement, the Soviets smashed the Yiddish linotype machines. I had to look up linotype. When I left pencils behind, I bought myself a typewriter. I'm writing this on a laptop in the sky. After the poets died, the location of their remains was kept secret from their families. Their families were exiled to Siberia. Their families were social outcasts. I only just learned about this. I was a social outcast as a girl. I'd get so high, I'd forget to brush my teeth. I want to remember how ill-starred the prison basement as I imagine it. I am finishing this on a plane from California. It was afternoon when I left and will be night when I get home. I believe in little, but I always say the schma on airplanes. I want to remember that we'll never know the murder weapon, but we do know it, of course, dozens of metaphors deep. I want to remember that until recently, I didn't know any of this. Um, okay, so the next poem I'm going to read, um, I'm changing it up a bit because Barb is here and there's actually a poem in the book that I dedicate to her and it feels like I should read that poem now, right? <laughs> what better time? Um, and it has very much to do with Jewish intergenerational trauma. Um, and it's, it's about my childhood love of the musical Fiddler on the Roof. Um, and, um, and then my like deep dive into it when I was at the library doing research and like what was really going on there. And, and it, it sort of got spurred on when I realized that there's this one pivotal scene where Tevya, who's the dad in the play, gets drunk and then he trades his oldest daughter's hand in marriage uh, to the local butcher in exchange for a cow. So he basically, <laughs> and then they sing about it and then they celebrate. And I'm like, what is going on? So I was like, I have to write a poem. Um, and the title is Too Jewish, which is what uh, a lot of producers were afraid of. And um, Shtetl Kitsch, which is what Philip Roth uh, referred to the, um, to the play as, that it was kitschy. Um, so if, if everyone could mute themselves, because the background noise is distracting to me as I, as I read, um, or if Laura, you could mute everyone, <laughs> is that possible? Um, all right, so um, I don't think there's any other words you need to know here, but um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just ask me after. <laughs> all right, so this is her bar. Two Jewish shuttle kitsch. Yes, I believe in generational trauma, plus that mix of pride and fear that 40 plus years in patriarchy didn't fix. I have a hard time saying no because you all are going to take it anyway, but I didn't come to monologue that. Synopsis, I am worried all the time because of this R. Synopsis, I want to talk about my childhood devotion to Fiddler on the Roof. Sounds crazy, no? but I didn't come here to choreograph how once I was so lost I couldn't leave the apartment and there was food trash on the floor and mice were feasting on the buffet and I wanted to die but didn't have the energy. Think about how, how our whole cast of characters would have thrived with some Zoloft to swallow. I pray to those pills most days. I'm gravely devout. I've got a shawl around my head made of chemistry and pluck. Act one. The constable has sympathy for the Jews, sure, but is powerless to prevent the violence. Who wants front row seats? Do you adore that part where Tevye gets hammered and trades his daughter for a cow? The Russian dancing is great. L'chaim, I know every word of every song. I listened to that box set of albums so many times the needle skipped at the wedding ballad, but it didn't matter because eventually I snapped both records in two. Sunrise, sunset. Passion is what I'm saying, obsession. Okay, well, like with everything, I was in it for the sex. Musical number, superstition turns me way on, but mostly I wanted to run away with the Marxist supporting character because like for all of us cozy American Jews, changing the world makes me wet. But I have to tell you, I don't think I've ever had a Jewish cock in my pussy unless you count the one whose wrong parent was Jewish. This is extraordinary math. 
All those women deciding their own fate despite the master of the house making side deals with Cossacks and Yentas. The lights dim. Quiet, please, in the back. We've arrived at act two. Tevier reaches deep into his soul, but he will not consent to his daughter marrying a gentle Gentile. Fuck off with your agency, daughters. What's a put-upon milkman supposed to do but bring that fiddler to America to keep the girls in line in the czar away? Cue the orchestra. Cue the aging sound system. Holler tradition at me one more time, I dare you. Holler tradition at me one more time, and my rage will swallow all of America and every last actor hamming up my damage to prove some folksy point about conformity, while the remains of us happen between blessing and bruising as we swallow pills to make the inveterate fear dissolve, deliver salvation to the craggy split of the vinyl reminder, revival. I am not trying to make a larger point as I have been too busy trying to keep panic down and men out of range of this umpteenth curtain call to triumphantly bang out what that might be. I get a little angry sometimes. <laughs> um, thanks for the claps. Um, all right, so I did change it up a little bit. Um, I'll read three more in case this is unbearable to you and you're keeping count. Um, the next one I'm going to read is also maybe a little angry. Um, it seems to be a chronic problem. Um, and this it's one not is called, a problem. It's, not a problem. <laughs> it's righteous rage. This one is called July 4th, 2017. And I wrote it um, on and then after July 4th, 2017, when I was in my apartment and there was somebody outside my building playing Yankee Doodle on like a little keyboard or something over and over and over again. And I was really just like kind of going bananas. And, I, and, and so to combat that, I, um, I looked up Yankee Doodle on Wikipedia, which I highly recommend you do because it's quite a ride. Um, and, and I read the, all the lyrics to the song and, and they're, you know, really something. Um, and so that, it was that mixed with uh, sort of my, this vendor that you'll hear about in the poem and sort of my rage about street harassment and all just kind of, and it being July 4th. So that's what's going on here. July 4th, 2017. I went the long way to avoid a certain shopkeeper who grunts at me. And instead I passed a street vendor selling star spangled towels and a tank top that reads, I have no tits. And I wish I was fearless enough to ask who that shirt is meant for. And if at this point in time, we should even consider irony. I've had tits for three decades. So I'm used to going the long way. Fellow Americans, I'm going to tell you something I've known since childhood. Men who want to hurt you, they want to hurt you because it makes them feel good to hurt you. Still, I'll admit, I woke up this morning so terribly sexy at 43, one hand on my thigh, the other in my hair, that I almost didn't worry a world past my own self. I recognize my own fireworks. Yankee Doodle, keep it up. That whole song is about guns and women. That whole song is about fragile masculinity. Stop calling after me. The curve of my flesh will not accommodate this hour in our history. And while many congrats on your glittering wit and your stiff two-toned riding boots on my throat, my fellow Americans, I'm curious what combination of fear and admiration makes a noise like father's gun only a nation louder. Um. All right, so nice to look up and see the claps on the corner. <laughs> you guys could do that for me like all the time, like when I do the dishes, <laughs> like, like they're clapping. Um, all right, I'm gonna read, the next one I'm gonna read is more about personal trauma and so trigger warning for um, sexual violence. Um, if you need to sort of mute this part, I understand. Um, I was asked um, right after Donald Trump was elected in 2016 to write a poem for Boston News Boston Review was doing a special issue on the inauguration. And so this is what I wrote in response to that. It's called Inauguration Poem. Do you know what it's like when a body twice yours holds you down in the room where you make your life until you wouldn't know how to move even if he wasn't holding you down and then he splits you further open and the world before had been filled with its usual losses and rages, not this 
what is this? Do you know what it's like when you live just one door away and every time you have to step outside? Well, no, he's not there, not now, but he could be. And the dread is everything for years, even when sometimes there is whiskey and sometimes there is joy. There is dread in the ficus tree on the landing and dread in the weather beaten flag by the garage and dread in the cash inside the mattresses that are always moving in and out of the building next door. And what if people call you corny because you still hold on to details like all the gray kitten posters on the gray walls of every quake proof hospital you were sent to to escape the dread and yet even when they pumped you full of drugs and even when they dried you out of them there was always dread and you were and you will be nose down in every room in which you try to make your life um, and then i'll finish um, with a poem called four mothers um, and I guess the things to know here are when I say that I'm celebrating the new year, I am referring to the Jewish new year, which is in the fall. Um, and then when I mention Sarah, Rebecca, Rachel, and Leah, they are the wives of the patriarchs, uh, the Old Testament, the Jewish tradition. Um, and just, it, it, just for some background on that, often in, in modern um, services, they add the wives in um, because they're like, lady names that they can shout out so it sounds like you know women mattered in the bible so uh so that's that's where this poem is coming from four mothers i celebrated the new year alone on a sofa eating frosted flakes while listening to country music i'm uncertain what to call this form of worship no autumn has answered a question like this the world holds me up finally while beneath me it crumbles under men and their monsters I won't genuflect towards anything I'm not also prepared to pleasure. Supplication makes me wince. I don't care how many Sarah's, Rebecca's, Rachel's, and Leah's any holy book wants to add to the modern retelling or in how many sermons we reach hard to find ways in which these wives counted. I don't want to be tacked on in fair practice and I'm done looking up synonyms for patriarchy in part because there are none. my little reading. <laughs> Thank, you. Lynn. Thank you. That was wonderful. That gave us a really great taste of the different poems in this book. There's such a, there's a range. I mean, they all go together, hold together beautifully, but you are addressing these different ideas and issues that I want to talk to you about. Yeah. But first, I, I just want to ask how the book started for you. I know that you had a Coleman Center fellowship and anyway, if you could just talk yeah. about how- Yeah, so the germ of the idea started, I guess it was uh, in about fall of 2016, when I applied for the fellowship. When you apply for a fellowship, you have to have a project that you're working on. So I was like, okay, let me come up with a project. So I had this idea that I was gonna write about, you know, my Jewish ancestors and my Jewish background and my Jewish upbringing and all that. And, um, but sort of in a more historical way. And I was gonna do research and, and all of this. And then, so I turned in my application, like two months later, Trump is elected. Um, and, and then I find out that I got the, the, the uh, fellowship. And then over the ensuing months, things are happening like Nazis are marching, chanting Jews will not replace us. And, and, and CNN has a banner you know, on, its, on its news thing that says, are Jews people? And like suddenly this didn't seem, none of this seemed very historical to me anymore. And I felt pretty foolish for, for actually even thinking that. It was a very humbling experience. So when I got to the library, <laughs> I got to the library in the fall of 2017, right when the two big things were happening, the Kavanaugh hearings were happening and the Me Too mo movement broke open. And so that was happening while I was trying to struggle. So it became more of a, a, a story about trauma, about trauma that, that women suffer with sexual violence and also trauma of the Jewish people, generational trauma, what we hand down, what secrets we tell ourselves and our children and, and what we've been told and all of that. And so it was, ended up being a very, different book than what I imagined, but the germ of it was still there. I mean, I just kind of wanted to explore. I've always had a complicated relationship to my, my Jewishness, um, but I've never, I feel extremely Jewish. Um, and I think that's not an unusual <laughs> way to be as an American Jew. So I just, I wanted to explore that more. Interesting. Yeah. I feel that like what you mentioned with 
you know, feeling like you were going to do this historical, you know, archival research project. And then, oh my God, the stuff, that's what the book feels like is, you know, the historical is present and ongoing as it is. And of course we know that, but I think you do this beautiful job of like moving from, you know, the personal to the historical and back again, and the present and the past are all mixed together in this really interesting and unsettling way that I, I mean, that as a compliment, um, you know, it's like, I think, I feel like historical poems can sometimes be comforting or, you know, a little cozy, but yours are not. You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, yeah. I, I guess I didn't really, um, I don't think I expected to find it sort of comforting. I think I was more trying to answer questions I had. Right. You know, like what, like, I, I mean, I knew of course where I came from and, you know, I, I knew I was lucky enough to know all my grandparents into adulthood, which is where, so I like, I had like, you know, th these relationships and all, but I, I just, I wanted to think more about what I wasn't thinking about. And actually the first poem I wrote for the book was the first poem in the book that I read, you know, and learning about, you know, these, these murdered intellectuals and I, I never heard it before. And, and it just got me thinking like, wow, there's so much I don't know. And so much I take for granted as an American Jew. Um, yeah. And and you know so what does Americanness mean uh, in and around my own Jewishness and so I I guess I had a lot to learn right right yeah I love in that first poem which is the night of the murdered poets that's what you were you mm -hmm. that was your first poem yes. that part where you're talking about the first poem I wrote was about bleeding from my uterus onto glare drenched stairs. After the poets died in a prison basement, the Soviets smashed the Yiddish linotype machines. I had to look up linotype. So again, it's this like wonderful fluidity that, you know. Where you're yeah, I, I think that's just, um, it wasn't always, but it has become the most comfortable or just the most interesting way to write for me is to sort of get outside myself and see how the world like reflects things back to me that I can then, you know, um, see myself clear and the world clear. And so as I was writing that poem, I was like, this is so, all of this is so wild <laughs> and somehow it's all connected. It's my theory that everything is connected. <laughs> so I'm just trying to get there. <laughs> I have some friends um, <laughs> QAnon that I can introduce. To. <laughs> Sounds interesting. I think everything's connected. To. <laughs> Check me out. <laughs> oh gosh. Um, that's the next book. <laughs> yes, that would be that would be quite a book. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was Are curious. Sure. <laughs> oh god, I was curious too about because I know part of the for the Coleman Fellowship you have to do research and they or they want you to do research that you could do at the library yes. right and so yeah I was just wondering what research looked like yeah. for you for well it's funny because when whenever you know they do the orientation there's it's mostly scholars and then there's a few right there's there was only one poet in my year I think there were three fiction writers and then mostly scholars so they're like research is their jam you know? yeah. <laughs> they're like no, really yay, archive. <laughs> and they know how they know what they're doing and the creative writers are like uh, lots of books um, so we had there were you know there was a learning curve and 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 also as a creative writer like as a scholar you know there you know someone was there to write a book on Andy Warhol and somebody else was writing you know a book on uh Baryshnikov and so there were these were very like targeted things and yeah. creative writers don't always know where they're right. going and so but I was lucky enough because they have the whole uh Duro Jewish division in the New York Public Library there so and they have their archives are tremendous I have like community newspapers Jewish community newspapers going back you know they have um uh individual uh family histories that like people would write and sort of bind to give to their to give to their children and grandchildren like where you wouldn't see them right. anywhere else and I love so I don't even know what of what I read like ended up in some way in the poems usually you know um yeah. but it just like doing all that reading kind of got my brain going and then it yeah it to write stuff and you were watching things too right did you yeah read oh yeah they have like the I mean the I mean obviously the New York Public Library's collection is extensive right. I don't know if you've heard of them <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's so much, so many things, so many books, so much film. So like, there's just like, it's endless. And at some point, and so I got there in September and at some point in November, I actually called it like no more research because you could honestly just spend your whole year just reading stuff because I was like I have to just stop for now I ended up going back but I like I need time to just write now or I'll just be researching the entire oh, nine months yeah and did you feel like the research it, it did kind of galvanize you to write right it wasn't like too much no I'm I'm a little bit um nerdy in my writing practice and that like when I decide like oh today I'm going to write from 10 to 3 that's what I do like there's like nothing romantic about my <laughs> muse situation here <laughs> like, and that's actually born from like having kids and where I had like okay these are like the 10 minutes today I get to write when they were younger and so I just sort of kept at that practice so once I decided that I was going to get to the writing part I was pretty I was pretty faithful to it oh, that's it great. yeah I mean yes I totally understand that <laughs> <laughs> you only have until three o'clock so yeah, that's right <laughs> right and that, that was the other thing like most people were staying at the library late and I was like gotta oh, go <laughs> right <laughs> oh, gosh. so could you tell us what is a refusenik and what yeah. is what does it have to do with this collection so a refusenik is it's it's um it's a name for a few things but um in this book in particular it's it's it refers to the name that was given to soviet jews who were denied visas to emigrate to israel and then also the united states and in the 80s and 90s, especially, there was a big movement among um, American Jews to get the, to get these um, Soviet Jews who are being uh, persecuted often they weren't allowed to work and, you know, terrible things were happening to them and, and so American Jews were sort of um, uh, came together to try to, to raise money and, and get them out to Israel to the United States and so and so the ref term refusenik comes from the visas being refused to them. Mm -hmm. um, but it also means like anybody who just sort of refuses, um, you know, expectations and what's been, what's been handed to them to believe it's just sort of a general refusal. And so that also I very much identify with. And so both of those things, and I write, when I was a kid, um, my, um, my father was a scientist and he'd gone over to this then Soviet Union to help uh, get these visas for um, Soviet Jewish scientists. And so a couple of times we had uh, Soviet Jewish families staying with us. And so um, I got to know this population very well. So I thought, you know, I really want to write it, but then so, so that's a, a big part of um, this book and especially the title poem, but also the, just the general idea of refusing um, mm -hmm. the ways in which we were supposed to do things or that we've always done things. Right, right, yeah. Oh, and you didn't, let's see, there was, there was just a part of Refusenik that I just wanted to read really, or maybe ask you to read. Sure. Ask you to read this part. Um, page 74 to 76 that section that starts with in daily news i'm full yeah just that one section yeah i can read i wanted that. Some more anger so <laughs> let's hear it <laughs> how i get my anger out in real life i swear i'm very mild <laughs> <laughs> comes out in the, on the page. <laughs> That's right. It just comes out on the page. So it's the, so Refusenik is the um, sort of anchor poem to this it's collection. It's 730. Sorry, my computer tells you the time. 730. <laughs> yeah. Um, 730. Um, so Refusenik is like, it's a very long poem and it's, it, it's about, you know, the speaker is, um, has, uh, someone has come over to her family and staying with her family from the Soviet Union and, and she's become friends with this um, with this person. And I, it's based on my life. I'm, I'm calling her the speaker because I think that's what we're supposed to do. I think so. <laughs> um, so this is a section of that poem. And I just want to see that there's, so here's this section. In daily news, I am full of vengeance because I was born with the Old Testament in my veins. The curator for Jewish texts couldn't look me dead on because maybe I talked about my pussy too many times in my presentation at the flagship library where I am being paid to write about Jews. I said, why don't we stop pretending modern Judaism gives a nod to women when on the wall of the last shul I stepped into that called itself feminist, a sign carved into the stone read, have we not all one father? And unless you take a chisel to it, I am done. 
1988, I told V I was nothing if not Jewish, and I knew I meant it, and I know I mean it now. Mm, thank you. I think, you know, you had mentioned before, like this reckoning with, you know, feeling very Jewish and, you know, like your Jewish identity, being very proud of your Jewish identity, but at the same time, kind of reckoning as yeah. you do in these poems with the patriarchal nature of yeah. this very, you know, <laughs> normal religion. Yeah. I mean, it's hard, you know, I, I kind of want to be like, well, you know, it's not Judaism's fault. It's like any religion. <laughs> Yes. Yes. All the major religions. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Exactly. And so, I mean, that's just how, you know, it's always been. But it was, I, there was that moment where I was in this synagogue and, you know, a female rabbi, very, you know, lefty Brooklyn kind of service happening. And then there's just this thing have we all not, have we not all one father? And I was like, "Eh." (laughs) (laughs) so, you know, I, 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 kept it together and then I put it on the page. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very yeah. nice. <laughs> um, I really, you know, in the poem you read, the D- July 4th poem, there's also, and the inauguration poem, I think, or inaugural poem, there are a couple inaugural yeah. poems. I love how you take, cause they sound like speeches, you know, like kind of patriotic speech or, and I love how you kind of co-opt that form and say very different things um, with the form. I was wondering if you could talk about yeah. where that came from. Um, well, in the July 4th poem, I just, I, I Hannah and I, I'm a little bit like kind of a wise ass sometimes. <laughs> so it just, it kind of delighted me just to keep saying my fellow Americans. <laughs> <'Cause> like, <laughs> Because I knew I'd get to read the poem. And then when I read the poem, I get to say my fellow Americans, like I'm anybody, you know. <laughs> so like that's why I, that's kind of why I did that. Um, but it also like with that poem, I was thinking very much that year um, about um, just, you know, what it means to uh, be an American. I mean, it was this entire book was written during the Trump presidency. Oh. Um, and so, um, yeah, it, it was just. I think we were all newly thinking about, you know, what Americanness means and represents and, and our part in in the the negative stuff about our country. So um yeah, I um I just sort of put that in there to both amuse myself, but also to to reflect back on like who who gets to make those speeches, right? And so that's sort of what I was thinking of. Yeah. There's and then, definitely, yeah. Sorry, and then the inauguration poems, you know, just twi- it just ha- so happened that two different magazines had asked me to write poems because that they were doing these special issues about the inauguration. Uh-huh. And both the poems, both the inauguration poems are about sexual violence because, I mean, as you know, I feel weird even having to point this out now, but at the time, like right at the end of that election cycle, it came out like all of these rape accusations against Trump that the tape came out about, you know, the, the, the grab by the pussy tape and all of this stuff, which I don't even, do people even remember this, but it was like big news yeah. then. And then nobody cared. And then he got elected and like, nobody cared. Yeah. Um, and so I was angry um, and rightfully so. And I felt like um, how any inauguration poem for Trump has to include sexual violence because um, he has been allowed to, you know, to do that unchecked and will always be and and no one's really even noticing like that that I even feel like I have to remind people that that happened is seems like yeah. a tragedy to me I heard, until you said that just now I, I mean it was like buried under all of the garbage that's been <laughs> piled on top of it of the other crimes he's committed right uh, yeah I mean like no consequences so. right in fairness to all his other crimes <laughs> like, yeah. I think, right? yeah. um, that that was you know but I, I mean you know, when you think of, you know, the, the crime of rape is second only in the legal system to murder. And mm-hmm. so, you know, that that nothing ever happened to it. That, and then that he just sort of boasted about it was just so, just so troubling. <laughs> I was like, this is, this is always going to be what I think of when I think of his inauguration, that people wow. yeah. knew that about him mm-hmm. and they just voted for him anyway. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, and you, you write about in national pastime, it's another kind of faux patriotic poem. And these poems are funny too. I think we should talk about this too. <laughs> yes, there is a lot of humor in them. Um, do you like talking about that? Well, I just like that people. Well, I get um, 
I get accused of being too serious a lot, which I know, I don't know. Oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I am I am very serious and about the things that are, I'm passionate about. Um, but I do, I do, I do um, like to write humor into things because I, I don't know if you it's 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 probably a very Jewish thing. Like if you can't just laugh at your it's, your yeah. enormous and and unsolvable pain, then what what are you going to do? Cry? So yeah. 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 Um, But um, yeah, I think like people often miss that the humor because the poems are kind of dark and like nobody wants to be the one at the reading laughing at like your poem about sexual violence <laughs> like not you know like it's just I understand it like I understand yeah. why people aren't laughing um right. but it's it's always nice when it's noted <laughs> so I appreciate that um but what I was gonna say before I got on that track was in National Pastime you you write about what it's like to be a writer writing about sexual violence and other you know, controversial issues in the 21st century when everyone's on social media and has horrible opinions about you that they air. Um, I just thought you really captured, there's the line in that poem, um, I wrote it down so I wouldn't have to search <laughs> for it. Where is it? Uh, it's about, oh God, it's about the overwhelm. Oh, am I thinking oh, yes. of the wrong? Oh, I'm thinking of the wrong poem. Oh, that's in this fall. I'm yes. sorry. This <laughs> fall. Yes. That's the one um, where you say, this is the century overwhelm became a noun, isn't yeah. it? And you kind of talk about, you know, cyber, oh, yeah. cyber abuse and how do you handle those negative responses? Yeah. Or I mean, <clears throat> Excuse me. So before I answer that, I'll just say like that poem where, where I say this is a century that overwhelmed by coming out was before the pandemic. So like I didn't even know. Oh, what was it? Like, wow. <laughs> um, little innocent Lynn like writing her little. <laughs> <laughs> um, but how do I handle I, I don't know exactly. I mean, I've gotten, I think I got a lot of it when I worked with a literary arts organization that was a feminist literary arts organization, Beat yeah. Up, and mm -hmm. I handled their social media and I got a lot of trolling, like just really, really terrible things. Um, some of the, I mean, it's just, Twitter is such a very strange place. The worst, um, one of the worst things that I ever got, <laughs> but which is also kind of funny and, and has nothing to do with writing, was that I made a joke because I had gone on a field trip with my daughter and this seven-year-old boy raised his hand and he said, I don't have a question, I have a comment. And I thought that was funny because, you know, that's what men do at Q&As. They say, I don't have a question, I have a comment. And then they talk about it. And, it's, yeah. and he was little, you know. So I made this joke. I said, I oh, on this field trip. This boy does a, did this thing and starts early. Ha ha. Right. Well, some conservative person on Twitter found this tweet. I don't know why. And suddenly I was getting like, like literally thousands of people trying to get me fired from the, my teaching job, which I didn't have. I was just a parent on the field trip. They were going to find out where I work and get me fired. From the job. Can't fire you from that job. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> yeah. Um, wow. So that's that's probably the worst that I got. I mean, the the funniest that I got. The worst that I got. I think I've had actual. I. At one point I stopped, um, I just scrubbed my Twitter of anything to do with my family and especially my children, because whenever I've written about abortion, um, the trolls come out and, you know, tell me like, you know, that my, my children should be taken away from me because I'm a baby killer and things like that, um, or threats against my children. So I just never talk about them on Twitter. It's a public account. And yeah. like they just they don't exist. Right? They they go on Facebook, yeah. which is locked, right? Uh, and like only people I know. Um, so yeah, so that's that's really tough because it's not something that really happens to male writers as much straight male writers, and it it's it it drives a lot of women off of social media, mm -hmm. and it, it it takes us and and social media is a way that we you know sell books and right. and all that, and so it just it's it's just another thing that that we, and when you write about when you write about subjects like um, rape or abortion or sex work, like you're just going to get people are unhinged about these topics and extremely uncomfortable with people talking about them openly without shame. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, if you don't, there's no shame that they they're they're just trying to correct you and introduce some shame <laughs> into your right. feelings about yourself. And it, it's just um, yeah, it's 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 it is overwhelming. And um, and yet I stay on Twitter. I don't know why. <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> just, you know, now 
I just tweet things about Dolly Parton. It's all very wholesome. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah. Nobody, nobody Everybody has to Dolly. <laughs> Dolly. Exactly. It's like the one person left. Right. It's Wait. literally the safest thing you could tweet about. <laughs> wow. That's, yeah. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, I will ask if anybody else has questions. I have more questions, but I've been talking for a while. So does anyone else have a Yes, Camille? Um, well, Lynn, I totally loved that. And I was cheering. I, I'm really tired, but I was cheering inside <laughs> and crying and, and laughing too. Thank you. I bought your book at AWP well, and um, I'm such a fan and that was a fabulous reading. Um, and I do want to say that I, um, I have so many comments like that young boy. I have to say at AWP at um at at, at my my panels um that the the man jumped up with a lot of comments and one even uh, got to the front and turned to face audience like oh that's amazing. <laughs> That's I've never seen that. I, yeah, I'm kind of I'm, I'm into it. Like, just go for it. That's right. what you want to do. Just do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, I I love the humor and I love the way that you move from the body and to you know fellow fellow Americans. I think that's such a feminist act to be constantly returning to the body and the personal experience. And I wanted to ask about. Um, when you're writing, um, Laura brought up the conversational tone that you have, and yet you go also into speechifying, like you move around to a lot of different tones and genres. And um, it's something I'm so interested in too. How do you, um, and they're also very chatty, right? They're, they're, they're like, you're talking, and yet they're very, uh, you, but there is, it is very clear that it is, it is a poem. So I'm, I'm wondering about how you, um, if you could talk to us about like how they start and how you edit them, because I think it's very hard to edit a poem that sounds like a speech act. And, um, and I think this is also part of your refusenik strategies because it is rather, it can, it is, I think a rejection mm. of the kind of, of poetic form in a way. And it's a, it's a feminist intervention to make ch chattiness, which sounds feminized, right? Yeah. Yeah. But this powerful, mm. you know, critique of the patriarchy. So, yeah. so that's one question I have. Um, thank you. And thank you for the nice things that you say. <laughs> um, I, well, okay, so two, two things. Like one is that um, you ask how I, how they come about. Um, I usually just write all in just like one block. I just sort of like, um, I always use the term like vomited out onto the page. I, I, that's really gross. I need to come up with a better stock explanation for how I write. But that's kind of how it feels like. It just like, it's, it's this burst of feeling that just comes out all at once. It's, it's not in lines, it's not anything. And then as I lineate it, I read it out loud. And I think that's where the chattiness of the second part of the question comes from. Um, I think um, I, I write them as if I am saying them to you. Like the sound of things matter a lot to me. And so I like, I need it to just sound like me. And, um, and that's, I really think that my poems do sound like me just talking to you, um, just a little angrier, because that's where I put my anger. But yeah. um, like the rhythms of, of it, I, I intend it to sound like how I would just talk to you about something. Um, but I mean, hopefully with a more sort of musical lilt to it and a more careful um, sort of uh, word choice than if I were just talking, speaking off the cuff. But um, definitely it is um, important to me that the topics that I write about become, are seen as valid and everyday subjects. And this is something yeah. I'm very, very passionate about because for so long in my career, and I hear that my, my a lot of my students are told this too, you know, we're told that these are kind of um, the subset of, of writing, you know, like it's, you know, th there's like the, the things that we write about, you know, love, death, 
weather, you know, these important um, philosophical things. And then there's like what the ladies write about. And, you know, and we write about, you know, basically harm that's been done to us, you know, among other things. And I'm trying to um, sort of ring the bell in my work and just also in my teaching and speaking that, that the subjects of, um, you know, violence against women, sex work, abortion, all of this is as old as anything else we're gonna, we're gonna write about or read about. And so it's important to me that it seem a little casual. Um, and, um, you know, people use the word fearless for my work a lot, but I, I which I understand the, the I understand why, um, but I, it's, I have fear, right? Like I, yes. it is scary to do this work and to publish this work, but I also feel like it is very necessary to just write my own experience um, and to show that it's pretty ordinary, right? Like yeah. it, it, if it's yeah. shocking, then there, it's not because it's new. It's because people haven't been paying attention, I think. Um, so I don't know if that answers your questions, but. I'm happy oh, to yeah. clarify. <laughs> Oh, yes. And it's it's anti shame, right? It's a refusal to be shamed because you already have been shamed and yeah. you feel shame and you feel afraid, right? You've are, you've been threatened. Your children have yeah. been threatened. It's real. It's not, right. you know, timidity or, you know. Right. And that's why there is fear involved. Right? And it's not it's not fearless. It's just sort of, um, you know, maybe foolish even, but I just kind of, you know, press on despite all of that because I just I'm just. Yeah. I just got to the, I think somewhere around uh, late 30s, early 40s, I got to like, I refuse to be quiet and shamed anymore phase. Yeah. I can't wait to yeah. my 50s. Like, that's going to be wild. <laughs> Who knows what the 50s. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm there. It's good. Things are yeah. awesome. Yeah. It's good. <laughs> sounds exciting. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Thanks, Camille. Yes, Barb. You have a question? Aunt Barb. <laughs> yeah. um, first, thanks for the poem. Um, but uh, I, I've been sitting here thinking about place, and you know, place has an important role both um, in your work and also in terms of generational trauma and and how that sort of travels through space and place. Um, but I was really struck when you were reading tonight and you talk about the orange trees not being native to LA. And in the past, you've talked about the palm trees not being native to LA. Um, and I think sometimes we think about, when we think about LA, we think of facade instead of things being real. But tonight I was thinking, uh, is LA just another refusenik? I mean, it refuses the desert, right? And so I guess, so I don't know what to do with that. So I guess it's a comment, and it's just saying maybe you have to write another poem to explain this to me. But I was going to say, is that a challenge? <laughs> that does sound like a challenge. That's great because I've had like literally no ideas lately. So bring it on. <laughs> does landscape play such a big role in your previous book? Right. I mean, it's 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 sort of the 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 foil against which you're you know you're you're thinking of your experiences and and uh, or the speaker is speaking about their experiences. So what does it mean if LA itself becomes the refuse next? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, I think, um, and it's interesting because in, in Landscape, which was my prior book, I was sort of reckoning with the landscape of Los Angeles that I didn't really notice so much growing up because I was just dealing with all this other stuff and I just didn't notice it all. Um, and in this book, I've sort of settled that, right? Like I, okay, like I've, I've, I've dived into the landscape of Los Angeles already. I've made my peace with it. Um, and it is interesting that I do sort of um, take on in some of the other poems in the book, um, the facade of, of Los Angeles and Los Angeles not being this thing um, in which we can live comfortably or like I couldn't. And I think that's so it's a really good question. I don't really have an answer for you yet, but maybe I'll have a poem for you at some point. You can have another poem. <laughs> but yeah, that, is, that, um, that landscape that I do write about. Um, I mean, I think all, I don't know if other, other poets have this, but all of my books are in conversation with one another. Like even my memoir, mm -hmm. um, there is very much in conversation with my poetry books. It's just like, I mean, it's just me, right? So like, mm -hmm. like I just keep, it's it's the same person writing <laughs> so the same experiences are written about 
same kind of obsessions and yeah. interests, right? That's what yeah. we all do. Uh, yeah, that's right. I always say to my students, like, they're like, I feel like I'm writing about the same thing all the time. I'm like, of course you are. That's sure. what we do. <laughs> what writers do. It's like my, I, before I had the title for Refuse Nick, I kept joking. My last book was Landscape with Sex and Violence. And so I was always saying the new one's going to be Landscape with Sex and Violence and Jews. <laughs> and so it's gonna be like the same yeah, cover it's been really funny <laughs> it'd be the same cover as landscape but end jews would be like scrawled across <laughs> that wasn't an actually good idea <laughs> that's amazing in my in my heart that's what it is <laughs> oh god oh, i love it thank you thanks for your question your comment <laughs> comments. only comments from women oh. yes <laughs> any other any other questions or comments for Lynn? Yes, oh, Camille. Uh, were you writing the Dolly book at the same time as these poems? This is a good that, question. That, that is a, that's a very good question. Um, so in case there's anyone on here who doesn't know me in my book, the, my memoir is also an exploration of Dolly Parton um, and her like her music and her cultural impact. And then it's like, also a memoir. Um, mostly I was not. So I, I finished uh, the first draft of Refuse Nick um, in 2018. Um, and I was so um, like exhausted and overwhelmed. And it was just happened to be a really crappy year in general. And I just didn't want to write dark stuff anymore. So I had this like really great idea that I would spend the, the whole of 2019 writing about Dolly Parton. Um, which then became the whole of 2020 and 2021 as well, um, which is great. I mean, I highly recommend it for anybody. Um, it also turned into kind of a dark book in places because again, it's me and I wrote it. But um, so I was, I took a long break with the book, but then I, I you know, I turned it in um, to my editor and, and as it has literally happened with all three of my poetry books, she was like, I think we need some at the end that are a little more hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would know by now. So I was like, okay. So this was in um, 2019 when I was still writing the proposal for the, the memoir. Um, so I had written a few chapters of the memoir um, and even just writing about a subject that brings me joy, I think made the, the final three poems a lot lighter, not, not fully light, right? Like it's not, you know, it's, it's, it, they are kind of dark in places, but I was just in a much better place by um, the end of 2019. And so they are more hopeful, which worked out well um, for my editor <laughs> who insisted upon them. <laughs> but for the most part, they were not written at the same time. Um, yeah, that's mm -hmm. basically the answer to that question. <laughs> So it wasn't, you weren't even trying to fulfill your, your editor's, you know, decree when you ended with, listen, when I write <laughs> poems again, this is the end of the book. I want them to be about joy. Yeah. Um, that was just, that was actually a challenge to myself. Yeah. Because I really, and now, and maybe that's why I can't write poems. <laughs> like, maybe, yeah. Yeah. like now I've got to oh, write gosh, poems. How do I do that? I mean, I would argue that there's a lot of joy in these poems, yeah. you know, I mean, joy is a complicated, it's complicated, right? It's I complicated also like, happy, but I find writing to be an immensely pleasurable, joyous experience. I know like some writers hate writing. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not one of those writers. I love writing. It makes me feel high and happy. And I could just, you know, it's, it's really one of the great joys and loves of my life. And so that I think comes across in the writing, even when the stuff is dark. It's just like, I feel really good when I'm writing, even if I'm writing really horrible stuff. The revising is less pleasant because <laughs> I have to like make it good and like really dive into what I'm trying to say. But the, that first draft is such a, it is really is a joy for me. But I do yeah. want to explore joy because I have so much joy in my life. I just don't know how to write it. And I think it's really right. hard to write. Um, so, I mean, I did try in the memoir, um, because Dolly Parton, of course, brings me nothing but joy, but, um, but, but uh, like poetry, I haven't done it yet. So I just, I need to, need to try. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe you need a different form. <laughs> yeah. You that's right. a joyous novel. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I can't like, what's, uh, what's a thing that, that happens? Novels are so <laughs> mysterious to me. <laughs> Just make stuff up. Oh I, God. I don't yeah. know if I have a brain like that. That's that's for you, Laura. <laughs> oh God. I don't know. 
<laughs> every time it's a mystery. Yeah, it seems like it must be. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyone else have final questions? We don't have much time. We just have a few minutes. I have I have a couple of questions I wanted to ask if nobody yeah. else does. Yeah, I just wanted to know about the Dolly book. You know, where did that start for you? Because I um, want to preview because Lynn has to come back to talk about the Dolly book I in love person. I next. have to say that I haven't talked much about the Dolly book because, you know, it hasn't come out yet. But right. when I do talk about it, it's just so much fun because it's not about, like, you know, violence and patriarchy. I mean, Maybe. it is, but like you also get to talk about Dolly Parton a lot, which is just yeah. really cool. Um, so it actually sprung from uh, my wish to write about joy in 2019. And speaking of Twitter, I went at the end of 2018 and I was like, what if I spend all year writing about Dolly, all of 2019 writing about Dolly Parton? I actually tweeted this out. People seem to like the idea. I, st I, would, I didn't really do anything with it, but then it caught the attention of someone who knew an editor at University of Texas Press's American Music Series. It was all locked. Like this doesn't actually happen usually in real life for, for yeah, writing. Right. <laughs> and they're like, we've been looking for someone to write a book about Dolly Parton. Um, never happens. Yeah. No, it, ne it, it never happens. Like, if, I can't. You're like clawing after the. <laughs> oh, absolutely. absolutely. I don't. It was total beginner's luck because I'm not a prose writer. And awesome. I was like, they're like, do you write prose? Sure, I write prose. <laughs> <laughs> I've written like one published essay at this point um so I just kind of like uh just faked it a lot um wrote most of it through the pandemic um and yeah it just sort of it it's it's she's such like a good stand-in for uh uh you know women of the 20th century you know she's like you know born in the first year of the baby boom um she's just she she co you can cover so much of American history with Dolly Parton <laughs> like she's just and so just so many facets of it and feminism and yeah. you know, and then writing too because she's and she's a stellar stellar songwriter and um a friend of mine had said that you know she, she she should get the Nobel along with you know Bob Dylan and who didn't show up to the ceremony but Dolly Parton would show up wearing heels and so <laughs> very high heels um so it's also like thinking about women artists and women writers I can't oh, wait to talk to you about more about it. Oh, I can't wait. I can't wait for it. But this is a fantastic book that's out in the world now. And thank you so much for, for coming and talking to me about it and talking to everyone. Um, it was wonderful to hear you read and talk about this great book. Um, thank so, you so much thank for you having Lynn. me. Thank you. Question. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, just want to say at the, oh, thank you, Michael, too, for being our great producer. And next time we're meeting is Friday, April 8th at one o'clock on Zoom with Seton Hall professor John Wargofke talking about American poetry and the spirit, because Lynn is here on the, on the, this like razor's edge between <laughs> Women's History Month and Poetry Month. So she's like the perfect, I know, perfect <laughs> person to usher out one and usher in the other. So thank you, so thank you again. Thank you. Lauren. Bye everyone. Bye Laura. Thanks for thank coming you. everyone.